Thank you for joining us here at Victory Church. My name is Becky, and I'm the worship director here, and we pray that this sermon blesses your life today. Don't forget to click and subscribe so you never miss a message. And now we kind of pick up the story. And then the apostles returned to Jerusalem from the hill called the Mount of Olives, a Sabbath day's walk from the city. When they arrived, they went upstairs to the room where they were staying. Those present were Peter, John, James, and Andrew, Philip and Thomas, Bartholomew and Matthew, James, son of Alphaeus, and Simon the Zealot, the Judas, the son of James. They all joined together constantly in prayer, along with the women and Mary, the mother of Jesus, and with his brothers. And then when the day of Pentecost came, this is again the celebration uh, that the Jews, one of their annual festivals, when the day of Pentecost came, they were all together in one place. And suddenly a sound like the blowing of a violent wind came from heaven and filled the whole house where they were sitting. They saw what seemed like to be tongues of fire that separated and came to rest on each of them. All of them were filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak in tongues as the Spirit enabled them. Now, there were staying in Jerusalem, God-fearing Jews from every nation under heaven. When they heard this sound, a crowd came together in bewilderment because each one of them heard their own language being spoken. And utterly amazed, they asked, aren't all of those who are speaking Galileans? Then how is it that each of us hears them in our native language? Parthians and Medes, Elamites, residents of Mesopotamia, Judea and Cappadocia, Pontus and Asia, Phrygia and Pamphylia, Egypt and the parts of Libya near Cyrene, visitors from Rome, both Jews and converts to Judaism, Cretans and Arabs. We hear them declaring the wonders of God in our own tongues. Amazed and perplexed, they asked one another, what does this mean? Some, however, made fun of them and said, they've had too much wine. This is the word of the Lord. All right. I love their explanation for it, though, because they're asking, what does this mean? And it's an, honest, it's an honest reaction. Like, what's going on there? Like, oh, they must, be on, they must be on crack or something like that. There's something going on. And they're like, no, they're just, Peter comes out and says, guys, it's nine in the morning. Come on. All right. You know, everybody is not going to be drinking at nine in the morning, except for maybe that guy over there. You know, nine in the morning. We all know who that guy is. So we're all good. We're not doing any of that. What you're hearing are sober thoughts. Now, when we read that story, uh, part of it is like it's an amazing story. We talk about the Holy Spirit just being poured out and filling everyone, and filling the disciples, and on that day, 3,000 people came to faith. But I want to talk a little bit, though, going back to chaos. I want to rewind the story a little bit. When we read that story, and we told you about it, on that day, Jesus had just left. And all he told them, these were his instructions, you will be by the way, I love that. You will be my witnesses. It's not so much of a kind of a marching order. You know, you got a job to do to go be witnesses, but you will be, like you will embody. It will be who you are. You will be my witnesses, like wherever you go. You're going to go to Judea. You're going to go to Jerusalem. And then if you don't know the geography, you have Jerusalem, which is right where they are. You're going to start there. You're going to expand out a little bit to Judea. Uh, you're going to go to Samaria, which we really don't like Samaritans. They were like, you're going to cross some racial tension boundaries kind of thing. You're going to go places where it's going to be uncomfortable. And then you're going to go to the ends of the earth. But he didn't tell them anything about how to do it or get it done. All he said was just go wait in Jerusalem. They're kind of in this chaotic now what state? I think we've all been there. Like, what do I do? We're supposed to do something. 
God, what do we do? And this speaks into the chaos of anything that you're living through right now. Those moments where you feel it's hopeless, you've reached a dead end, uh, you're fearful, you're anxiety, you have anxiety, you can't sleep at night, you're struggling, you're feeling like the anxiety of either two things happen where you feel anxiety and fear and you've got to rush. We've got to do something about this. You want to rush to fix it. Or I tend to be the other way around. Like I just go do this and just pretend it's not happening. And we do that and we just kind of ignore it or you just want to quit. And in none of those moments, though, do we ever really stop to think, and Jesus says to wait. And the disciples, what did they do in the middle of chaos? They went and, I heard it, somebody said it, they prayed. How often do we do that? To really slow down and pray to God and ask him to engage the world within which we live, and not just the world within which we live around us, but actually in our own homes, in our workplaces, wherever that chaos is. And they prayed. And when we think about that prayer, and they got together, and they got together in that prayer meeting. Uh, if you've ever been to a prayer meeting before, uh, sometimes they make you feel uncomfortable because you know, talk out loud and you're not sure what to say. Well, that person needs, seems to know what they're doing. I have no idea. Uh, how do we do this? And we really don't know. Well, I want to tell you what that prayer meeting probably looked like because it'll inform us today how our prayer life should look like. They didn't have any magic incantations. They didn't do anything particularly special. They just prayed how Jesus taught them how to pray. Because if you don't know it, a, couple, a few years before, they had to ask Jesus a question. Because they had two examples of prayer in their life. They had the religious leaders, and these stories, by the way, make me really uncomfortable. Because the hired church people, me. Okay, you have these guys who are doing it wrong, and then you have the other guy, Jesus, who's doing it right. And so they came up to him one day, and they said, Jesus they watched him go off and pray by himself, and that he did this regularly. He's talking to God. Well, how do you do that? How do you do that? Because we don't know how. And then Jesus just goes, well, this is what you're going to do. One, don't be like that guy. Don't be like those guys who are out in public who are making a scene, really, uh, like street corners, who are out there praying publicly using... Uh, really loud, big words, loud prayers, big words, and they just kind of go on and on and on and on and on and on and on. And I was laughing this morning because during our traditional service has a lot of big words in it. And I remember one part of the service, I read it and it's like, we thank you, Lord, for these salutary gifts. And I'm like, Ugh. okay, we got to do something about that because that's a big word that maybe... One of our other members, I mentioned that to him, he said, yeah, if I were reading this on my Kindle, I'd hit that word and ask it for a definition. All right? We can't pray like that. He says, let's don't pray like that because that's kind of, um, that's for a show. What you need to do is you need to go off. He said, find a small room in your house somewhere. Go off be by yourself. And so the disciples, what did they do? It says that they were in a room by themselves. You, know, you can make an assumption. You may think, like, well, it's because they're hiding from the authorities. Well, I think a lot of stuff has died down by now. Remember, it's just like 40 days since all of this happened. And so maybe some stuff, maybe some people are looking for them. I don't know. But I really think their intention was just to get together. Find a place that was away from the crowd so they can actually be there together and praying with one another. And then Jesus taught them. He said, okay, go off by a place by yourself. And then what I want you to do is I want you to pray like this. And it's a prayer that we do every Sunday. But he said pray. He didn't say pray this. He said pray like this. We kind of turn it sometimes into pray this. And there's, it's a good thing. He's Because he says, hey, just be short on words. So the Lord's Prayer is actually really short. I love it. It's just very succinct. He didn't say anything about preaching. So he said prayers. All right, be short and succinct. Okay. And then he said, thank you, Tony. You're always here to get a joke. That's good. Uh, and so he said, be short and succinct. 
And the first thing you're going to pray for is you're going to address God like this. Our Father. Okay? So the first word is what? Our Father. And just to kind of dig down in that for just a second, for a minute, or ten. Our Father. Okay? It's just a communal prayer. You know, often we think in terms of uh, my personal relationship with Jesus. Yes and no. Yes, we all have a relationship with God. We have that going on, but it's not meant to be done alone. It's meant to be done together. Uh, one of my favorite pictures uh, that I have on my phone or computer screen somewhere is a picture of my dad and my sisters all in his lap. We each had a personal relationship with my dad, but he was our father. Like, there's room for everybody there. And we say our. So it's meant to be done together. Uh, there's the Bible verse where Jesus said, he said, where two or more are gathered, I am there. I am with them. If two or more ask for anything in my name, I'm going to give it to them. Because you're going to be of one heart and one mind. Our Father. And probably one of the best things I ever did in my life, and I realize it's not just my career, but as part of the impact on my life, was the day I realized I couldn't do this alone. You try to juggle everything, family, you're trying to juggle church responsibilities. I say church, not like, ah, oh, great church leader, oh, you're so awesome. No. You have responsibilities. We all have a calling in life, and so we have responsibilities. And at any point in time, it can all be overwhelming. How do you get it all done? And I felt it, and because as a prayer, people, we are a private, you just can't necessarily share all your stuff with everybody, and we're all like that. It was when I called my friend, and I said, hey, uh, every Friday or Monday or whenever could we do that? That was Dave, by the way. This is, everybody knows Dave as Dave the Prayer. This is before Dave that Dave. This is previous Dave, all right? But he is my, still a man of God, but reading the Bible, doing his stuff, on his discipleship journey. But I said, Dave, I know him. I know he'll listen, and I know him. It doesn't go anywhere. That's why I said, Dave, uh, can you pray with me? just so I can have a place where I can talk and then we can pray about these things. And we still do that every week. And that was, I don't know, a decade or more or less, I don't know, a while ago. And it's been a beautiful thing because it's supposed to be done together. And when you have people sharing life together and you're praying to our Father to address a situation, and when he says two or more gathered in one place, it doesn't always have to be, well, we have to go to a prayer meeting at church. Those don't happen a lot. But you gather together every day with people. And it could be once a week, a uh, particular day, you sit down at dinner with your family, you wake up with your spouse, and if you don't have a spouse that you're together on that kind of stuff with, you do have friends, you have coworkers, you have uh, Kevin. I look at Kevin over here because of his Bible study at Chula Vista High School that they have together, public high school, but they have Christians who get together and they pray together. And one of the guys is Clint McDonald, who's also a member here, who's not here today, right? So we're going to call him out and say, he got a call out and then he didn't show up. So you have together, when you're there together to support and to pray with each other, and you're praying for God to engage. And you're saying, our Father, and you use that reference of God now is identifying who you're praying to. And so here the disciples are gathered together, and they're praying to God. They're looking at our Father, and they had the name. They ripped off uh, Luke when he wrote Acts, ripped off all the names that were there. You had all the disciples. You had the women that were important. They're all gathered together there, and they were praying together. And they're praying things like our, so they're together, calling for God to engage. And they said, our who? Father. They could have said, Lord God Almighty. They could have called out Yahweh. They could have a variety of phrases. But Jesus said, call me, call him 
Father. And that should take their minds, their minds, uh, we remember in how God, because of what he did, allows us now to call him Father because Jesus died for our sins, restored our relationship. We can call him Dad. We can call him Abba. We can call him Father. Whatever term of endearment that you have, you can call him that. But not only that, he is the Father that the person that you are talking to can actually do something about the problem. Because how often do we get caught gossiping, complaining, and talking to somebody else who can't do anything about it instead of actually going to the one who can? He says, go to me first in prayer for everything. Go to the Father. And then it calls to mind another lesson that he told his disciples. He said to them one day, he said, listen, guys. Your Father in heaven knows everything that you need. So there's nothing really to worry about. So your Father in heaven says, you, Kenny, you're a good dad. Are you a perfect dad? No. Okay. Kayla's like, no. Anyways, he's not a perfect dad. No, he's a good dad. Good dad. I think the majority of people, majority of parents, not all, but the majority of dads are good. They know how to give good gifts to their kids. And so Jesus told that. You know how to give good gifts to your kids. If your kid asks you for an egg, how many of you give him a scorpion instead? Ha ha, playing tricks on your kids. No, a good dad doesn't know how to do that. And then God said, listen, like Kenny, you're, you mess up, you mess, but you do know instinctively how to give good gifts to your children, even though you're inherently a sinner. You know how to do it. So if you can figure that out, what kind of gifts is your Father in heaven who is perfect? What kind of gifts are he going to give when you ask them for it? And Matthew just says the gifts of God, just talks about it. When you ask God for things of his, in his mind, you ask God for what he wants to give, there will be good things that he'll give. But then in Luke, it talks about the gift of the same story, but it says how much will the Father give the gift of the Spirit? And so maybe this is resonating in their minds. They're, our Father, we're praying for the Spirit that this is the ultimate, one of the ultimate good things to give to me, to fill me, to do whatever it is, to fill the room, to me, whatever it is, but God, you work and you engage in my life and the world around me. That God wants to do that. That God wants to do that. And then their prayer continues on and they say, our Father, you got to forgive me for this because I have to go through all the steps to get to where I want. So our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. God, we know you are holy. We know you're in heaven. You're in charge. I'm not. It's a humbling statement. I am not in charge. I'm not the creator of the universe. My name is not holy other than what you've made holy in me. God, I need you. We need you. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. And in this moment, we're praying not just, oh, Lord, your will be done. You know, well, I saw it in my hands. Fate. No, it's just simply, God, you are so awesome and incredible. We want you to be glorified in our life. We want you to engage. We want people to know you. We want your light to come. So, we want that to happen. So, therefore, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven, meaning your will be done in me. You know, a lot of times we look at other people and go, man, the government, they should act like, oh, these people should act like that, or that people... No, be done in me, be done in us, be done in our church, be done in our family, be done where in our workplace, be done everywhere it is, but be done in me. And they're praying that together. And they have no idea what this looks like. Because remember, they have no plan. They have no plan. In the book of Proverbs, uh, King Solomon wrote, because he had years of wisdom looking back at life, and he goes, humans make plans. And he doesn't say God laughs. It says human makes plans, but it's the Lord who guides the steps. It's the Lord who does that. So they can't move without him. 
They can't move without him. We can't move without him. So we invite him to come in. And we have to wait. We have to wait. And I think waiting causes a lot of anxiety because we've got, we want you to engage now. We want it to be now. Do the miracle now. How many days did they wait? Jesus sent it at day 40. Pentecost was on day 50. How many days did they wait? 10 days. And it wasn't like Jesus came down and challenged them and say, okay, pray every day for 10 days and then this will happen to you. They had no idea. One day, when you're in the middle of it, whatever it this, wherever it is you want God to engage, one day can feel like an eternity. And then it turns into two days, and then three days, and then four days. Is God going to do anything? Because darn it, I've done this and I've done that. And anxiety starts to build up. And you're like, God, where are you on this? But then God grounds us in the prayer time together when he says, give us this day our daily bread. I've got it figured out. Because in that prayer, because God tells us to pray for things. Again, he's not the bad dad who says, I'm going to give you an egg. Ah, here's a scorpion. He's not playing tricks on you. He says, wait, I've got a plan. Your daily bread is taken care of. What you need for this life is taken care of. Anxiety and fear has no place in your life. Your future is taken care of. Trust me, I'm going to take care of it. I've got the plans. I know my ways are higher than your ways. It will take care of it. We have got your plans. So if you're freaking out and you're going to run off and do this and do that, ground yourself right now. Give us this day our daily bread. I've got a plan. We're going to be okay. Now in the meantime, while we're waiting, forgive us our sins as we, have, as we forgive others. And that's a beautiful moment because so often in the middle of the chaos, sometimes you've got to recognize your part in the chaos. You know, forgive us our sins because I do mess up. I have made the world a worse place. I have hurt people intentionally, unintentionally. And you got to do that. And then you ask God for forgiveness, and then that leads to forgiving others, and then you're able to come together finally. So restore this relationship, and imagine the kinds of stuff that the disciples had to go through. Remember, they all ditched Jesus. How did they welcome? We know Jesus welcomed Peter back into the fold, but how did they do that? You ditched, you ran, you did this and you did that. But they're able to come back together and they continue to pray on these things. To forgive, to forgive the soldiers, to forgive the persecutors, to forgive the crowds, to forgive the people, to forgive, 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 forgive. And this is all happening in that room. All happening as they're praying together. Lead us not into temptation. You know, give us this day our daily bread. Help us to forgive. Lead us not into temptation because when we don't get our way or what we think should happen in a timely fashion, we like to short circuit things to go find a different way to get it. Serving other idols, other things like. I need to do this, I need this. Uh, he says, help us to do that. Help us to not run out of here. Help us not to ditch because we're tempted to either go too fast or we're tempted to quit. We're tempted to not show up. I'm not going to do this because, dang it, we've been here for nine days. I don't know if I can do another day. No, come on, come on, come on, come on. Lead us not into temptation. Deliver us from evil. And this is beautiful prayer that there is an evil presence we know in the world around us, uh, but who has really no power over us other than what we give him. And Jesus said, pray that I will deliver you from evil, that the Father will deliver you from evil. And if he tells me to deliver 
if he tells me to pray for that, that means that's something he wants to do. So deliver you from evil. You're safe. You're going to be okay. Whatever threats may be going on around you, you're going to be okay. Your salvation is not dependent on it. You're going to be okay. And imagine that prayer happening all the time, every day. Now, it wasn't like they, they sat around and did that from, you know, sun up to sundown. In the book of Acts, we, we skipped a ch- section where they're like taking care of some business. They did stuff, you know, but they're doing this. They're meeting together every single day like this. And they're praying and they're praying and they're praying. And they're praying for God to engage. And then it was time. And it was undeniable for all the waiting that they had to do. Boom! It was time to go. There was no waiting once the Holy Spirit shows up. The whole wind place filled up with wind. Tongues of fire came down. It was time to go. And God gave them the strength and the energy to go and do it. And you had these fishermen, these uneducated guys, people who everybody hates public speaking. Everybody does. I do it every week, and I hate it every week. All right, I don't like it. I'm lying. I do like it. But I don't like it at other times, right, when I'm put on the spot. But we don't like it. We don't like it. I was super scared of it for a long time. And here you are, these guys being called out to go in front of the crowds. Jesus did that. They did not. And next thing you know, they're filled with spirit. Tongues of fire come down. And they, Peter has all the words. And it was the perfect words. One, they could hear it all miraculously. They could all understand it. They could all hear it in their own language. And the beauty of that is that when they hear in, those of you who live here and English is your second language, you know what it's like to hear news or story or a message in your first language. Especially when you haven't heard it for a while. And the next thing you know, somebody drops something on you in Spanish. You're like, what? I'm going to hang out with that person. I love that. Or uh, whether it be if you hear something in Russian or if you hear something in German, if you hear something in some other language, there's something about it that you're just like, it just hits you right here. And all these people that day, and they were gathered together. And do you think God knows what he's doing? He chose that day. He chose Pentecost. He chose the day that every single person that had been there at Passover, just about everybody had made that same journey to be there for Pentecost. All these people, they knew what had happened. They knew what happened. They knew the whole thing of Jesus. Remember the guys on the road to, the Emmaus, road to Emmaus? They looked at Jesus and said, what are you guys talking about? He said, are you the only, are you, who are you that you didn't hear about this guy? That you didn't hear about this guy who died And then some other guys are saying he's alive. Now we're coming back to that story again. The news cycle has kind of passed a little bit. It may still be on their minds a little bit, but probably hasn't been talked about too much. Well, we're going to refresh all of your minds. And then Peter gets up there and says, like, what's going on? He says, we're not drunk. It's only 9 in the morning. And I've always taken that to mean, like, you know, catch us at 5 maybe. But 9 o'clock, 9 o'clock, no way. It's not going to happen. And then he gets up to tell them what's going on, what you are witnessing and what you are seeing here. And God gave him the words from Joel saying the Holy Spirit is being poured out onto the God's people. The Holy Spirit that was promised is being poured out right now here in your presence. And then he says, and guess what? We're going to talk about this guy, Jesus. And he talked about Jesus. He opened up the Old Testament. And he said, this is our Messiah. And here's all the reasons why we know. As the son of David came down the line, here's how we know he's the Messiah. And guess what? This Jesus, you killed him. This Jesus whom you killed because they were all witnesses to it, complicit. They watched it happen. And none of them at that moment is recorded. I'm sure there's a few there who said this, but none of them is recorded. Got up there and said, it was the elders. It was the chief priest. It was this guy or that guy. Their response to it was, their response was, we killed him. And then Peter says, and he rose from the dead. 
like the Terminator. In their minds, this is bad news. Because kings come and crush their opponents. Kings come and wipe people out. Spend some time in the Old Testament. It's about political assassinations and wiping out your enemies. You have all this stuff happening. Bad kings. Bad kings do this. The Romans do that. Pilate was a guy who wiped people out. And they said, oh no, what should we do? You know, the last few weeks we've been talking about proofs for the resurrection. And at some point, we reached that point of, okay, now we figured out it's true. Crud. What do we do? Yeah, we followed him. We left him behind. What do we do? In Peter's words, repent, meaning turn away from your old life, be baptized for the forgiveness of your sins, and receive the Holy Spirit. Done. And he could say that, though, with compassion. Because they've been praying for forgiveness, to forgive, to be forgiven, and then to forgive others. And they could say that with every break of that this was good news, that yes, this happened. And guess what? We turned on him too. We betrayed him too. But he forgave us, gave us new life. And this is for you, and not just for you, but for your children and your children's children, and all who far, far off, and who, all those people who live in Chula Vista, California. They had no plan for Chula Vista, by the way. They weren't thinking about, ah, how do I get across over there? The issue was, go to the ends of the earth. And guess who, who did that? God got to the ends of the earth.